dancing down here, he's dancing up there every Friday night. And thank God for the vision. Say amen to that. How many believe the Bible? You sure? You really believe it? How many believe Ephesians 5, 22? How many knows what it says? Come on. Don't be scared. Husbands, love your wives. But there's a verse before that that says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Amen? Amen. Well, you guys better start memorizing those verses. A few months ago, it was pouring down rain. I just knew we were going to be late for church. We had a memorial service. About a half mile from the church, we had a flat tire. And I told my wife, well, I didn't tell her. I take that back. You don't tell them anything. I asked my wife to get out and change the tire. And she said, I don't think so. I said, haven't you read Ephesians 5.22? Not yet. And so, for those that believe in Ephesians 5.22, don't ever ask them in, in, in the other verse, don't ever ask them to change a tire because they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. God is good, amen? amen? A few weeks ago, I preached at a little church, and they had two sets of, of pews, one on this side and one on that side, and an aisle down the middle. Old country church, everybody just done anything they wanted to. Nobody could sing, but everybody tried. And so I said, okay. If you want to get out early, this side say hallelujah, and this side say amen. And they did pretty good. I said, because I like to get done early. So the louder you say hallelujah and amen, the quicker I get done. So I went back a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday night, and I was sitting on this side. And I said amen. The guy turned around and says, no, you're on the hallelujah side. <laughs> Can't win can't win. Um, I don't think that I ruined Pastor Bishop's reputation. I think they got me. 
And sitting on the platform next to those two guys is like being in jail. <laughs> they gave me a doctorate degree, and I come back, sit down beside Brother Hank. I looked over at him. I says, I don't know why they gave this to me. I just quit drinking two weeks ago. <laughs> so that's what got me and Bobby and Brother Hank in trouble. Sister Mickey did like that. But God's good. I read this the other day. I'm not very much on Facebook, but I tell you, there's some things on there that's crazy. Policeman calls in in radio's headquarters, and he said, Hello, is that you, Sarge? Yes, go ahead. We have a case here. A woman just shot her husband for stepping on the floor. She just mopped clean. Sarge says, Have you arrested the woman? No, sir, the floor is still wet. And you can tell Brother Bobby, I heard he went to the doctor the other day and he was feeling bad. And the doctor said, sir, you're a very, very sick man. Bobby says, can I get a second opinion? The doctor said, yeah, you're ugly too. <laughs> so tell Bobby I said that. We might as well keep it going. <laughs> the man that's got the shofar, where's he at? I'm blind too, if you didn't notice. I left my hearing aids at home because I heard this place was wild. A bit. It was a rumor, but it, it is not a rumor anymore. <laughs> Would you do that one more time just for me? My, my brother-in-law's sister came tonight. Um, uh, my ex-brother-in-law. Every time we go fishing, he catches three or four bass, I catch lily pads. <laughs> I don't think they've ever heard a chauffeur for, before. Would you do that for me, please? For Jesus? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> there was so much excitement here tonight. You guys will know when you get my age. When you're 70, your mind wants to get up and dance around like you guys are all doing. My foot was going. I just couldn't get it going. I know you were trying to wake me up. Last time I was here, I slept till the music was over. I'm just kidding. You couldn't sleep through this. Man. <laughs> if you want to know why we're really here, we're taking up a collection for a helicopter. <laughs> I left my home at 530. I called my sister. She said, we'll go. They beat me here. We got here at 10 after 7. And I said, thank God for the music. <laughs> because we got in, a, we, there was an accident on Hillsboro. We like to never got here. But God is good all the time. And Gary, where are you at? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Playing those drums for Jesus. I bought a set of drums in our church before Gary came to the lighthouse, or right after he came to the lighthouse, and a lady came up to me and says, why did you buy those drums? I said, I'm waiting for Gary to come play drums. Well, I didn't put my money in there for that. I said, well, it wasn't your money after it got in the plate after all. <laughs> it was the Lord's. You know, so <laughs> and she didn't like that. But I have a tendency to tick people off anyway. I don't do it on purpose. It just happens. I was on Facebook the other day. I didn't even know much about Facebook. Brother Hank's been trying to teach me. And I was answering Dr. Brown a question that he had or Something he had on there about marriage being for one man and one woman. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. Somehow I got a hold of this nut. <laughs> she was a nut. She went on and on and on and on and on. I, she said, I don't think you understand the difference between marriage and reproduction. I said, sure I do. Anybody can get married. I said, but put two 
male dogs together and two female dogs together and see if they can reproduce. Now listen, there's a bunch of crazy people out there. God ordained for a man and a woman to be a husband and a wife. And so, and so we ended the conversation with, with this. Have a nice day. Because I knew where she was coming from and I knew what she was. And I don't condemn anybody because if it wasn't for the grace of God, where would I be? I wanted to preach tonight. Can't eat a bite. Can't sleep at night. And the woman I love don't treat me right. <laughs> but the Lord changed it. <laughs> so you'll have to tune in to next time. So if you have your Bibles, please. And by the way, if you hear something strange, it's my stomach growling. <laughs> I haven't ate since lunch. I'm very hungry. And if you'll say amen real good and loud, amen. I'll... I ain't going yet, Gary. <laughs> Strange crowd here. I'm going to find me a place to eat right after church. Amen. And I'm going to pig out. <laughs> I was on a diet until tonight. <laughs> but if you have your Bibles, turn to your Bibles to Proverbs chapter number 24. And let's stand just for a moment for the reading of God's Word in honor of God's Word. And I have a message, I preached it at Faith Outreach, but I felt nuts to do it here tonight also, called You Can't Keep a Good Man Down. Amen. The Bible said in Proverbs 24, 16, for a just man falleth seven times, for a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Father, thank you for your word tonight. But Lord, without you, we would be nothing. Without you, we could do nothing. Thank you, Lord, that we can have a good time singing and praising your holy name. If people don't get prepared down here for it, they're going to be in shock when they get to heaven. So let us rejoice in thy word tonight and thank you for the good music and the praise and the worship. Now, Father, if there's one here that doesn't know Jesus, this is what this is all about. Now, singing is good and preaching is good, but seeing sinners saves better. So we thank you for your word tonight and we pray if anybody doesn't know my Jesus, tonight will be the night they'll come to know him as their personal savior. And come to worship him in the spirit of truth. I pray that I might say something to uplift the saints tonight. Because we're in troublesome times. We're in hard times and we need an uplifting tonight. So hide us behind the cross. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for what you're doing and thank you for what you're about to do. And all God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. You can't keep a good man down. Somebody looked over at me a while ago and said, you got cowboy boots with pointers on them. Well, that's the kick. You can't ride a white horse, according to Revelation 19, with tennis shoes. They just don't work. When you ride a horse, you ride with cowboy boots. You can ride with tennis shoes, but you won't look very manly with it. So I just like to wear boots. So anyway, horses have blinders on them. And the reason they have blinders on them is so they won't lose focus in a race. The Christian blinder is prayer in the Word of God. Prayer in the Word of God. If you don't pray and stay in the Word of God, the Bible said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The moment that you take your Mind off of God and don't pray and read his word. You're going to start drifting. And tonight's message is called, You Can't Keep a Good Man Down. Look over at your neighbor and say, You Can't Keep a Good Man Down. <laughs> the number seven is mentioned 
over 600 times in the scriptures. Everybody falls, according to the Bible, the just man. I'm talking about the man that's been washed in the blood. I'm talking about the man that's been redeemed. I'm talking about the lady or the man or the teenager that's been saved, goes to church, prays, loves the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind. I'm talking about people that are in love with Jesus. Every now and then they fall. Every now and then they fall. Thank God for the lighthouse. Amen. Amen. Every now and they fall. And when they fall, you can't, you got to keep getting up. You can't stay down. David sinned over and over and over and over. But in Psalms 51, 10, he said, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. People want that new heart, but they go around with a nasty attitude. A, 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 a right spirit is having the right attitude. And so we need to have a right attitude. So keep getting up from sin. If you went places that you shouldn't be going, stop it. If you say things that you shouldn't be saying, stop it. James says uh, this, uh, uh, cursing and blessings all not come out of the same mouth. Uh, Dr. David Wilkerson, uh, gone to be with the Lord, he's got a book called Sipping Saints. It's a good book. Everybody ought to read it. In many of our churches today, we have the most cussing and drinking saints that there ever was. Thank God for the lighthouse. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but in churches today, we have people that cuss like sailors and drink. And they drink, and they drink, and they drink, and then they come to church. Listen to me. We need to learn to abstain from all appearances of evil. The just man falls at seven times. He falls into sin, but he gets up. He gets up. He gets up. Thank God for the lighthouse. You get up. Brother Hank got up. Brother Clyde got up. Everybody that's been in the lighthouse, you've got up coming to the lighthouse and getting restored. And Brother, Brother Leonard had a vision of people having transformed lives. Amen. So if you fall into sin, get up. You can't keep a good man down if you get up. I've been working on a sermon called one foot in the church and one in the world. And that's the way it is. I hate to see it. We need a revival. I'm glad that you have uh, this center called the Lighthouse Revival Center. We need a revival. God's people need to be happy. God's need, people need to be joyful. We need people to uh, have their foot in the church and not in the world. And some people are that way. They'll go out and get drunk and they'll go to dances and they'll do this and they'll do that and they'll stay in the world. And then on Sunday morning they come and praise God. You think God's impressed with that? <laughs> do you think he doesn't know what you're doing? The Bible says he that covered the sin shall not prosper. So you and I won't prosper if we cover our sin. So keep getting up. After David got his heart right, he was a different man. And when you get your heart right and I get my heart right, we, something happens to us. We become different. And we, we, can't, we can't teach other people the things of the Lord if they see in us sin. We can't do it. David said this, I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted. After he got his heart right, he said, I'll teach transgress, 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 trans, transgressors. <laughs> I used to stutter. And I quit, and then I started back again. <laughs> when the devil comes knocking at your door, tell him nobody's home. Don't open the door. Don't let him come in the back door. A lot of people uh, 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 let him uh, uh, come in the back door. He can't get you in the front door, but he'll come around the back and get you some other way. Tell him he's not home. Resist the devil. Keep getting up. 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 Listen to me. The only reason Peter began to sink, 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 uh, rebels call it sink, northerners call it sink. <laughs> when he was, Jesus was walking on water, the only reason, reason that he began to sink is because he got his eyes off the Lord. And the only reason you'll sink is when you get your eyes off the Lord. Why well, makes some people go through the, the lighthouse and they do well and they go on and, 
And, and they've got more of opportunity here than any place on earth. I don't know of any place on earth where you have an opportunity like this. I've had several people that call me and say, Pastor, do you know where I can send my grandson? I said, yeah, perfect place down in Riverview. I said, but, you know, you got to stop smoking. Oh, well, you can't stop smoking. <laughs> well, just come on down here and light her up. <laughs> just come on down here and tell Brother Hank and who was ever in charge. I just want to smoke if you don't like it too bad. <laughs> now, they want help, but they don't want the discipline. That doesn't make sense. And now guess what? Her grandson, if she would listen to me, is facing about 15 or 20 years in prison. And I've had that several times in my church. I try to get people help to come down here, and they don't want the rules and regulations. Oh, they got me up doing this, and they got me up doing that, and they got me going to church, and they got me doing it. Hey, what do you think this is, a picnic? <laughs> I had a stepson I brought down here one time about five, six, seven, eight years ago. Brought him down here, sat in Clyde's office. He had been on drugs all his life, in and out. His daddy told me, he said, I expect to find him overdose one day. And so we brought him down here and we sat in Clyde's office. He wasn't here two days and he called, Mama, can I come home? <laughs> Man, I'd have left him down here. I would have never come and got him. But you know how mamas are. Oh, yeah. oh I'll be right there. I'm so sorry you had a rough time, honey. Oh, come on, give me a break. The lighthouse is the best thing that ever happened to you. Keep getting up, keep getting up, keep getting up, keep getting up. Where can you go and get food, clothing, education? Where, can, where else can you go to get all you get here? Good singing? Good preaching, good screaming, good hollering, good everything. Where else can you go to get all this? Nowhere. Riverview, Florida. Lighthouse Revival Center. Where else can you go? Keep getting up from sin. Not only that, keep getting up from failure. You say, well, I failed a test. Well, study harder. The reason people fail a test, I had a young lady come to me one time. She said, Pastor, would you pray that I pass, uh, pass this test tomorrow? I said, no. She said, what? I said, have you studied? Well, a little bit. I said, well, if you fail, it's because you hadn't studied. And if you do fail, study again. And if you fail, study again. If you fail, study again. You know, people just... Oh, God, help me to do this. And oh, God, God wants you to do your part. If you'll pray, Lord, give me the wisdom. Give me the insight. Help me to see what I need to do on this test. And I'll guarantee you, if you study and you listen to God and you seek wisdom from God, you will pass the test. Keep getting up. I had a young guy in my church years ago. About 20 years ago, 1980, somewhere around in there, nice guy, got saved. I baptized him. He went off into the Navy, got out of the Navy, come back, went off to a Bible school and just saturated his mind with Scripture. He could quote hundreds and hundreds, I'm not kidding, hundreds and hundreds of Scripture. But he couldn't find a job. He said, Pastor, what do you think my problem is? Don't ever ask me. <laughs> do not ever ask me a question. I said, you're lazy. He said, how can you say that? I said, listen, son, I've helped you every way I can. I gave you a place to stay. I bought you a truck. I gave you some of my tools. I never got my tools back. You're just a cotton-picking, lazy, no good for nothing. Christian. <laughs> he said, I can't believe you talk that way, preacher. I said, you want a job? He said, yes. I said, okay, go get the phone book. Go through the yellow pages, and you look up, and you call every phone number in that yellow pages on something that you can do. If you, if you can cut leaves, whatever you can do, a labor job, just do it. 
I went and bought two newspapers, and I sit down, and I said, don't get up from this seat until you've called every one ad in, this, in these two papers. i got to do all that? No, I'll do it for you. He was just lazy. We got a bunch of lazy Christians today. They want everything for nothing. Listen to me. I seen this the other day, by the way. If you're tired of living with your stupid parents, get out, get a job, pay your own bills, buy your own groceries, pay your rent, buy your own car, and give me the phone back that I bought you. And in 1957, the Silhouettes had a number one hit called Get a Job. Yeah. Da, 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 da. You see, you got all that part. Da, 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 da. Get a job. Da, da. See, you heard everything in that song but get a job. <laughs> number one, get a job. Get a job. All the parents, hey, listen to me. I didn't have a cell phone until I was about 50, 60 years old. Now the kids has got cell phones. They got everything. They know. More. Matter of fact, they teach you how to use them. <laughs> it's true. Keep getting up from failure. If you fail, keep getting up. Thomas Edison is said to have many failures in his life. But listen to what Thomas Edison said. I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> oh, I like that. He invented things that changed the whole world. He also said many of life's failures are people who don't realize how close they are to success and they give up. A lot of people quit just before God's fixing to bless them. Keep getting up. Keep getting up. If you fail, keep getting up. Keep getting up for failures. Listen to this. If you don't get anything else, now listen to this. Babe Ruth struck out 1,330 times in his career from 1914 to 1935 during the regular season. He struck out 30 times during the World Series. But he hit 714 home runs. He hit 104 in 1927 alone. Hank Aaron struck out 1,383 times. But he hit 41 more home runs than Babe Ruth. He hit 755 home runs. But as far as strikeouts, Reggie Jackson struck out 2,000 times, hit three home runs in game six of the 1977 World Series, and the most home runs of any player in the World Series. He's now in the Hall of Fame. You see, failure is not always failure. You can fail but not be a failure. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Now listen, you don't have to say amen. I could preach. I have preached for four hours. Now, y'all may be laughing, but old Baptist preachers in camp meetings, I have preached until people just fall asleep. <laughs> but my drill instructor, a guy next to me, did that before I went to Vietnam, and he picked up an ashtray, old metal ashtray, and hit him in the head and woke him up. But listen to me. If you fail, keep getting up. Keep getting up. Keep getting This is my favorite getter-upper right here. Abraham Lincoln, listen to this. He lost his job in 1831. He was defeated and run for Illinois state legislator in 1832. He failed in business in 1833. His sweetheart died in 1835 and he never got over. And <clears throat> he had a nervous breakdown in 1836. He was defeated in his run for Illinois speaker in 1838. He was defeated in his run nomination for Congress in 1843. He was elected to Congress in 1846. He lost his renomination in 1848. He was rejected for a land office in 1849. He was defeated as run for Senate in 1854. In 1856, he ran for, uh, for a vice president and he lost that. He was again defeated for his run in Senate in 1858. But I tried to preach that sermon. Sister Allison had did go over as good as she did. How big is your butt? Now, I knew what she was talking about, but when I preached it, it didn't go over as good. <laughs> so if you got a big butt tonight, it ain't my fault. But <laughs> he was elected president of the United States in 1860, 
And that's all that counts. He kept getting up. He kept getting up. Listen to me. If you fall, get up. To fail is not the same as failure. Many times people fail, but it's only a temporary setback. It's not the final chapter of your life. I just found this out Wednesday. I was searching online for something. In South Korea, there's a 68-year-old woman who has failed the driving test 771 times. 700, she's 68 years old, trying to get past her driving test, 770, but guess what? She's going into office to take it again. She will not stop. She will not give up. She will not accept failure. There's all kind of things on there about her failing. Why don't she quit? Listen to me. She's got it in her mind. She wants a driver's license. Now, me, after about four times, I just drove without her. <laughs> not her. 771 times. And she's going again. Keep getting up from failures. Always keep your eyes on the path ahead. Don't look back at the stumbles and the bad falls. They're gone. Did you hear me? They're gone. Whatever you've done in the past is gone. Can you say gone? gone. Can you really say gone? gone? You say gone better than you do amen. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Look at what you have accomplished now. I don't care if you've been in the lighthouse a week. You may not like it right now, but down the road you'll thank God for what you have accomplished. What you've accomplished. The first time I ever was introduced to the White House, it was at Brother Lewis's uh, upstairs in his cafeteria over there. I was so impressed by the changed lives of uh, of men and women in the lighthouse. I wish they would have had something like this. They probably did, but I, I didn't know anything about it. My sister sitting here, she can verify. I got a brother that's been in and out of prison all of his life, 30-something years in prison. He's now out. He lives down here in Riverview here somewhere. I wish he would have had a program that he could have came to and got some help, real help, you see. He told me, he said, uh, brother, he said the hardest drug I've done heroin, I've done uh, cocaine, I've done LSD. He said, but that crack cocaine just keeps gnawing at me and gnawing at me and gnawing at me. Thank God he's out now and doing good. But I wish there would have been something. It probably was. I just didn't know about it. Listen to me. Look at what you've accomplished. Don't ever give up. When you're down to nothing, God's up to something. Did y'all hear my stomach growl? <laughs> I don't hear no amens. I... Yeah. Keep getting up from failures. Keep getting up from sin. Keep getting up. Listen, number, number three, keep getting up from heartaches. People say, oh, you don't know what happened to me. So-and-so did this to me. So-and-so did that to me. So-and-so did this to me. Oh, grow up. <laughs> Learn to forgive. Learn to forgive. Forgiveness is hard. But listen, until you do, you're defeated and you give the devil the victory until you learn to forgive. If you think you got your feelings hurt, try being a pastor. Try, 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 try being a pastor and everything's going good. You got to preach on Sunday morning and some little old lady comes up to you and she said, that was a terrible message. <laughs> Studied all week for a terrible message. I said, you think that's bad? You should have heard last week's. <laughs> See, I've always got an answer for it. I don't care how bad they say to me. What, I, what, they can cuss me out. I say, boy, that's the best cussing I've ever had. <laughs> Y'all think I'm kidding. God gives you an answer for everything. If you'll ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you. Oh, pastor, we had a great time today. A little lady in our church, she's 80-something years old. She's always running around with a tambourine. We call her Tambourine Jenny. <laughs> I baptized her husband when he was 82. He just died in, in December. He was 90-something. I went over to visit him in the, in the nursing home, and he said, Pastor, I'm ready to go. I'm tired of all this. He started looking for Jesus. He got that far away look. See, when you get ready to go with Jesus, you get that far away look. 
People don't understand it, but people that's getting ready to go, they understand it. And he said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. She come up to me one day after church. She said, Woo, Pastor, we had a good time. I said, What did I preach on? I don't know. <laughs> but we had a good time. See, some people think as long as they got a tambourine doing a lot of shouting, they're having a good time. That's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I was in a camp meeting, 1982. Everybody's shouting. Old Baptists do do that every now and then. You know? They were shouting and running the old-fashioned Baptist, running down the aisle, had altars full of people crying. And I said, got up, it was time for testimony. I said, what are y'all going to do when the devil knocks you? Wheels off your shouter. Got real quiet. I thought it was time to leave. <laughs> About a year later, I got a call from this young preacher. He said, Brother Keesley. He was crying. I said, what is it, son? He said, I, I thought you quits the camp meeting. He said, when you said, what are you going to do when the devil knocks your shouter out? And he said, I've been mad at you for a year, and I just called to apologize. I didn't know he was mad at me. And I don't care when people get mad at me because I don't. I got to go to sleep. Let it be bad. And I said, "Well, tell me what's going on, son." Well, they're fixing to bolt me out of my church. And he said, "I ain't got nothing to shout about." See, I'm telling you, when he gets down to the nitty gritty, church work is hard work. I've had him try to throw me out, starve me out, bomb me out, <laughs> bolt me out. That's the truth. Baptists are notorious. We used to have Wednesday night fights. <laughs> now, y'all laugh about that. Y'all laugh about that, but that's true in the Baptist church because I pastored Baptist churches for over 30-something years. I know what I'm talking about. I had a guy come one time. He gave $100,000 to the church, and he began to have little prayer meetings behind my back and one day I said brother David uh, he become uh, the treasurer and I said brother David you can't leave here with that offering he said preacher if you touch that offering bag I'm going to deck you I said well brother David that's like saying sick him to a hound dog <laughs> that's the way southern boys talk I reached to grab that offering bag and he was going to swing at me we had a guy in my church, sweetest guy, about this big around. Nothing wrong with being that big around. That's just the way he was. He grabbed that man, put a bear hug on him. He said, you're not going to hit my preacher. You're not going to hit him today or any other day. Buddy, I'll tell you what, you better protect your preacher. He said, if you take that treasure job away from me, I'm going to sue you for all the money I gave. I said, wait a minute. You got to talk to God. You gave it to God. I thought now the real motives come out. You you gave it for some other reason, Judas. And you know what? That rascal was so mean he wouldn't give the wouldn't give the checkbook back. I just went over another checkbook, another account. He came to church on Wednesday night. I walked out to him. He had a drive through like y'all do. I said, Brother David. You're welcome to come in here. I said, but if you start anything, I'm going to beat the tar out of you. <laughs> he said, well, what kind of preacher are you? I said, a fed up preacher. <laughs> now, I know we're not supposed to be brawlers, but every now and then the old flesh kicks you. <laughs> so keep getting up from heartaches. Somebody hurts your feelings, just pray for them. You know, this thing called forgiveness, if they won't accept your forgiveness, that's between them and God. Get it off your chest. That's, get it off your chest. Don't, don't hold a grudge because God won't answer your prayer. Keep getting up from heartaches. Keep getting up from reversals. You say, what's that, Pastor Jimmy? Dr. Jack Howes, he used to pastor the largest Baptist church in America. He used to have pastor's conferences all the time. He had 85,000 church members. He brought in 20,000 on a bus day one day. All day long he had church. All day long. Church, 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 church. One day a person come down the aisle to join the church. 
And one of the ushers took him up to the baptistry. And they got him up to the baptistry. He thought, well, what am I doing here? I just come to join the church. You got to be quick or dead in that church, though. He got up in the baptistry. One of the Mother Howells was baptizing that day. And this guy said, oh! Oh! Every time he'd go to Ducky, Dr. Howell stopped us. He said, can anybody out there interpret what this man is saying? And the lady said, yes, sir, Dr. House. Now, this is a sophisticated church. This is where they wore bow ties. I was thinking about getting a tuxedo tonight. I said, no, I won't fit out. And he says, can somebody just please interpret? And the lady says, yes, sir. You sure? He said, yeah, tell me what's wrong with this man. He said, my pants are falling. My pants are falling. <laughs> he never asked for another interpretation. So anyway, he catches a plane. He goes to Garland, Texas. He used to pastor there. He's seen these two guys fighting. Big guys just beating a tar out of the little guy. Just beating him up left and right. Dr. Howell's sitting there, and he says, man, that don't look good. I need to go over and break that up. He walks over to break it up, and the little guy says, don't stop now. Don't stop it, Pastor. Don't break it up. He said, what do you mean don't break it up? He's beating you up. He said, I don't care, but I'm just now getting my second win. <laughs> and you know what we need in our churches? Second win Christians. Amen. You may get down, but get up. Amen. You may fall into sin, get out. You may fail, but stop it. Keep going. You may be going into heartache, stop it. Quit whining about somebody hurt your feelings. Oh, there's hypocrites in the church. Oh, well, there's hypocrites at Walmart. That don't stop you. <laughs> there's hypocrites at the gas station, and gas is down. What if you went to a gas station? Gas is $1.65. You go up there and say, I want some gas. And the hypocrite walks up and says, you can't have it. You see, there's no excuses. I've got an evangelist friend. His name is Harold Lee. He's an old timer, older than me, older, older than me. He's older, older than me. <laughs> you like that, didn't you? He wrote that song, Excuses, Excuses. I hear them every day. And the kings have made it popular in the, in the, in the 80s again. There's all kinds of excuses. What kind of excuses can we have in our churches today to not want to serve the Lord? It's too hot, it's too cold. Your hair is too long. It's too short. Here, about four or five years ago, somebody gave me an old Mercedes. Had bulletproof windows. You need them around here. <laughs> Brother, Gre Brother Greg, <laughs> Brother Greg, you say, Pastor Jimmy, you going to give me that Mercedes? I said, no, Brother Greg, I love this old Mercedes. I kid you not. I went to visit a lady in the nursing home. Tambourine Jenny was her name. And I was, had one of the men with me. First thing he did when he walked into the nursing home, he said, Sister Jenny, Brother Jim's done took all the money out of the church and bought a Mercedes. <laughs> oh, my God, I wanted to kill him. <laughs> uh, now, a few years later, I got a settlement from the government, from Agent Orange, because I have a heart condition. My brother, younger brother, died, stepbrother died, because of Agent Orange. It ate his insides up and I, I went out and bought me this little Cadillac station wagon oh I just love this little I love Cadillacs anyway could have been a Ford could have been a Chevy find on the road dead fix and repair dealies but it was a Cadillac brother hey? <laughs> nice little Cadillac lady walks into the church she says must be nice to have a Cadillac I said it is <laughs> how did you get it I said I went to Vietnam I got sprayed with Agent Orange I've had three heart attacks <laughs> I've had three heart attacks. I've had two motorcycle wrecks. I've been stabbed twice. I've passed 200 kidney stones. That's how I got that Cadillac. <laughs> That's the truth. So we decided to take up an offering for Jesus for Christmas. Do y'all do that around here? I went and ordered some envelopes. Take up an offering for Jesus. It's his birthday. As a matter of fact, in our little church, we took up $800 more than our regular offering. Just by those simple offers say, you know, give Jesus a birthday offering. This guy called me. I was coming back from Pensacola. Cola. He left the church early one day. And I thought, well, that was odd. So I called him up. I said, hey, brother, how you doing? Won't be back. <laughs> oh, 
That's a pastor's heartache, you know, if I won't be back. Don't let the door hit you. I didn't say that. You didn't hear me say that either. Brother Hank heard me say it. Anyway, I love this brother. I love the good, the bad, the ugly. And I said, why won't you be back? What's this birthday offering for Jesus? Oh, my goodness. What is Jesus going to do, buy you another Cadillac? I said, no, he didn't buy that one. I bought it. I said, he just gave me the wisdom to get it. <laughs> See, you can't win. If you wear an old suit, oh, you need, a, you need a new suit, preacher. You get a new suit, guess what? Must be nice to have a new suit. <laughs> can't win. I had a car given to me, a 1977 Cadillac. I didn't know I was going to get it. I was out looking for a car up on Hillsborough Avenue. They used to have a car dealer there. He got cars from St. Petersburg where the old people live, where I live now too. <laughs> I was looking at this 77 blue Cadillac. And I said, boy, I'd sure like to have that. The youth director said, you're crazy. I said, I believe the Lord's going to give me that Cadillac. I said, he just nudged me a little bit. See, when you, when you tell people the Lord nudged you, they think you're crazy. Has anybody ever been nudged by the Lord? Just get that feeling the Lord was going to do something for you. I was visiting the hospital, St. Joseph. I come out of the hospital, got my car, and went to start. This fellow walks out and says, man, you ought to get rid of that piece of junk. He said, there's a 1977 blue Cadillac down on Hillsborough Avenue on 40th Street. Go down there and ask the guy how much he wants for it, and I'll buy it. Oh, well, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I went down there, the guy said $4,000. I went up to where he was, got a check for $4,000, and got a blue Cadillac. Mm. 70s had blue Cadillac. Mm. Woo! Yeah. I thought I was King Tuck in that Cadillac. <laughs> Big old plush seats. So I drive up to the church the next day. Lady comes out, hands me the keys to a 1978 Mercury Marquis. And she said, God told me to give you this last night. I said, well, I'm sorry. God just gave me that one. I said, you need to give it to somebody. I can't do that. He told me to give it to you. <laughs> you can't please people. <laughs> you can't even give Cadillacs back. Or, this is true. You're, you're not talking to somebody. Listen, June will be 48 years I've been in the ministry. I can tell you stuff make your hair stand up. <laughs> and I can tell you some bad stuff, too. And I said, ma'am, give it to some. No. I will not do it. He told me to give it to you. I said, well, I ain't taking it. I'm stubborn. She walks into church. She says, by the way, I want to teach Sunday school. I said, you're not a member of the church. I don't have to be a member of the church to teach Sunday school here. I said, well, yes, you do. <laughs> she thought I was kidding. She said, you show, show me where I have to be a member. I said, you're looking at the pastor. And I said, you got to be a member of this church before you teach Sunday school in here. She left the church. I didn't get the car either. <laughs> what we need is some second wind Christians. Y'all don't have that around here, but I tell you, in the Baptist churches, when they get ready to vote you out, I remember one time, the first church I pastored, Brother Hank, I started with 19 people. And Seven months later, we had 450. I baptized 104 in the lake. And all of a sudden, people got mad at me. You know, when you're young, you preach on anything and everything. I was preaching on short hair, long hair, pants, smoking, tobacco chewing, drinking. I, you know, that's how you do when you first get started off preaching in the Baptist churches. I preached on hell's hot, heaven's real, and... We had a church split. Well, they came in that night. That side, my side, was empty. This side looked like a sinking ship. <laughs> There's nothing more meaner than a backslidden Baptist. <laughs> I can say that because I was one. <laughs> now, the story ain't finished. I want to tell you something that happened that night. I said, Lord. I'm in trouble here. I got behind the pulpit. I thought, how could this be? 
19 to 450, baptized with 104 in the lake. Lord, this can't be happening to me. I felt like that little preacher got my wheels knocked off. And I opened my Bible, and it fell on the Scripture, and the Lord said, read that. And you'll never believe what the Scripture said. It said, touch not mine anointed. I read that Scripture, and I said, whatever your pleasure. The lady stood up in the back. She said, we want our church back. Okay. She had a nervous breakdown, wound up in mental institution. Another lady stood up. Said, we want our church back. She said, the radio program is good, but you're preaching on sin too much. Her son had a skiing accident in Colorado and died two weeks later. Another man stood up and he said, I'm tired of you preaching on sin. I said, okay, what's your pleasure? We want our church back. I had his son. I was teaching him so winning. I had baptized his son. I had baptized his daughter-in-law. His wife didn't want him to be married to that girl. She wanted, my, he, she wanted her son back home. I had him going soul winning with me. I was taking him out soul winning, teaching him how to go soul winning. He said, we want our church back and we're going to get it back. I kid you not, three weeks later, the young fellow was driving a car down on 301, flipped the car over three times, his, fell out of the car, the car landed on his head and split his brain three places. He laid in the vegetable for six years over in Havana Avenue. Another lady got up and stood up and she says, we want our church back. She was mad because I was preaching against smoking. Listen, smoking won't send you to hell. Just make you smell like you've been there. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon smoked, but he didn't know it was a sin, see. Charles got in an argument with D.L. Moody one time about D.L. said something to him about his cigars, and Charles says, okay, fatty? Because D.L. Moody was a little chunky guy. See, obesity is a sin, too, you see. You've got to be careful. When, you, when you're pointing at your sin, somebody, you better make sure their sin is not any worse than yours, you see. And so the lady says, tired of you preaching on cigarettes. I'll smoke when I want to. About five years later, I got a call to go to the hospital. I went over to the hospital, and I said, what's wrong? The pastor was gone. Me and he was a good friend. She said, oh, my brother's got pneumonia. My brother's got pneumonia. And the same one that got mad at me for smoking, the doctor come up, and I said, doc, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this man? What did he really die of? He said, well, see, you know, when you cut yourself, you don't sweat there anymore. He said, a lung is like a filter. He says, that's why people get emphysema, and that's why people die prematurely, because that, 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 it cuts off the, the, uh, the filter, and they get, they, they get to where they can't breathe. He said he just smoked himself to death. And she's sitting right there, and I didn't say a word to her because, you know, I felt bad. But see, you know, people do anything. Had another fellow come, and I'll conclude on that. He came to me. He said, we want our church back. And he was mad at me because he came to the church drunk about a month before. And I said, you can't come in here drunk like this. I'm not going to put up with it. See, some people tolerate a bunch of baloney. I ain't going to tolerate it. And he says, well, I'll come in here if I want to. I said, well, we're fixing to fight. If you come in here, we're drinking like that. We're not going to put up with that, you see. The, the, see, the problem is there's no respect for God's house anymore. There used to be a time, uh, let's go down to God's house. Used to be a time, let's go down to the church. Used to be a time where there was respect for God's house and God's man and the things of God. Well, he just rebelled against me. He had a motorcycle wreck and is in a wheelchair to this day paralyzed. See, you don't touch God's man. It's better for you to pack up. Move. As a matter of fact, it's easier for you to pack your suitcase and move than it is the preacher move all the stuff he's got. And I'm not trying to be. I'm not trying to be funny or mean or anything. God, when God's man is right, you better not touch him. Can you say amen or boo? Amen. I used to say say amen or boo, and the lady hollered out boo. <laughs> I quit doing that, Sister Allison. <laughs> we need some second wind Christians. Keep getting up from sin. Keep getting up from failures. Keep getting up from heartache. Keep getting up. If you fall, rise again. If you fall, rise again. The just man falls seven times, but he rises again. If things are going bad, get up. 
I want to be the type of Christian when things are going bad. Make some adjustments. Make some adjustments. By the grace of God, I'm going to fight the devil as long as I can keep getting up. I'll kick him as long as I have feet. I'll hit him as long as I have hands. I'll bite him as long as I have teeth. And when I lose my teeth, I'll gum him to death. <laughs> keep getting up makes men out of you. Keep getting up shows character. Keep getting up gives you power with the Lord. When you keep getting up, you're saying to the devil, you are not going to win over me. I am going to keep getting up. Knock me down, I'll get up. Knock me down, I'll get up. Knock me down, I'll get up. If you sin, get up. If you fail, get up. If you have heartaches, get up. If you have reverse, things going in reverse, get up. But most of all, now write this one down. You got a pen? Listen to me. When you come to church, you need pen and paper. You know why? Because God might have something for you that you'll miss up here, but you'll have it there. My wife will tell you, sometimes we'll be talking, I'll say, I'll be right back. I go to my office and I write down what I was, God spoke to my heart about. And if you write in your Bible, 30, 40 years later, you can go back and say, wow, I heard that message, keep getting up. Or whatever pastor has preached, or whatever the bishop has preached. I heard that. Look here, what I heard. And see, you'll remember it. Keep getting up because he got up. Amen. Do I need to repeat that? Amen. Keep getting up because he got up. They falsely accused him, they arrested him, they plucked his beard out, they sped upon him, they beat him beyond recognition, they placed a crown of thorns on his head. But I want you to know, my dear friend, he keeps getting up. They nailed him to a cross. They thrust a spear in his side. They crucified him. They placed him in a tomb. But thank God, hallelujah, on the third day, God the Father said, let's go get my son. <laughs> Sent the angels down. Tombstone was rolled away. And he walked out of the grave. And he's sitting at the right hand of the heavenly Father right now, interceding for the men at the lighthouse, interceding for the ladies, interceding for the teenagers, interceding for the interceding for us. Why? Because he loves, he kept getting up. You can't keep a good man down and you couldn't keep the God man down. I keep getting up because of this. I was just thinking today how good God's been to me. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I keep getting up because he promised never to leave me, never forsake me, mislead me, never overlook me. His goal for me, can you imagine? All he wants is a relationship with you. Through music. Through that shofar. Through the jumps. Through the all. He wants a relationship with us. That's all he wants. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he forgives me. When I'm weak, he's strong. When I'm lost, he is my way. When I'm afraid, he's my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I hurt, he heals me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I am blind, he leads me. My brother that died of Agent Orange, I called him a few months before he died, and I said, Bill, how you doing? He said, all right. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm sitting here watching TV. I said, Bill, you can't be watching TV. You're blind. He said, but I got a vision. See, a lot of people don't have a vision. Fanny Crosby was blind, but she had a vision. Amen? Fanny Crosby. He, I said, well, what are you watching? He said, I'm watching the Andy Griffin show. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah? He said, listen, because I'm blind don't mean I can't see. He said, I can, I can remember what Andy looks like. I can re re remember what Tubby looks like. I can remember Aunt B. I can remember uh, Barney. He said, I can, I can just see them as the TV's going. He said, I've got a vision. See, some of you young men need to get a vision. You got a vision. Brother Leonard had a vision. Who would have ever thought in a million years this vision would have lasted this long? Not only a ministry, but a church to have, come and have a good fellowship in. And so, anyway, he had a vision. He had a vision. Helen Keller had a vision. First word she said, and I love this. Brother Hank, she said, water. 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 
Now, I don't know if she's talking to Jesus and saying, I want some water, but that sure was pretty words. Did you know she went on to get degrees? She had a vision. We can have a vision too. Keep getting up. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he's with me. When I face persecution, he seals me. When I face problems, he comforts me. When I lose, he provides for me. When I face death, he going to carry me home. My mom will be passed away tomorrow. She passed away in 1999. And she had that far, far away look. She had a breathing problem. And I remember her saying this. I said, Mom, I got to go now. Got to go make some the narrows. She said, the narrows. And she took her last breath, and she said, I love you. Whew. I seen something on Facebook, and I sent it to my sister today. I, 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 in a moment, I would want mom back. But with all the things going on down here, I think she's better off in heaven. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to meeting her. Say amen to that. I'm looking, for, I'm, look, I'm, I'm going to be having that far away look one day. Y'all pray for me. I'm, 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 I'm serious about this. I'm looking for Brother Hank to invent a urn that holds ashes. When you do like that, it starts talking. <laughs> now, see, that's funny to y'all, but, you know, I would love to hear my mother's voice say, Jim, I love you. I'd love to hear my mother's voice again say, Jim, I love you. I, I'm proud of you. See, you record all that before and have it put into that thing, and, and it would be so awesome to hear my mother's voice again. You see. But better than that, it'd be better when I meet her. See, that motorcycle wreck gives me this limp, but when I get to heaven, the limp's gone. I'll be out dancing some of you whippersnappers. He's everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, every way. He is God. He's faithful. I'm his. He's mine. And I keep getting up because he loves me so much. So whatever you do, just keep getting up. Now, what's the difference as I close? Baptist preachers close five or six times. <laughs> Pentecostals, well, he's almost Baptist. He's always going to close. He never closes. Made me forget what I was thinking when she pointed at you. <laughs> Senior moment. Brother, I may need you to finish. <laughs> Isn't God good? Yeah. All the time. Now I say this. What's the difference between the lost? The man that falls seven times and gets up. We have somebody we can go to. We have a heavenly father. The unsaved don't have the Heavenly Father. They, they, they can't call him Father. They can only say God. And until they say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he is not their Father. I want to be serious, but i got to inject this before I get real serious. I was in Walmart. Y'all started laughing. I ain't even said anything. <laughs> I was in Walmart a few years ago, and I was walking in the automobile department, Brother Hank, there's this little Chinese kid. He kept following me around, grabbing me on the pants. I said, shoo. <laughs> I'm serious. And I went on the other side of the aisle, and he kept following me around. He grabbed me, daddy, daddy. I said, boy, don't you say that again. <laughs> I'm serious. I said, you go find your daddy and your mom. I'm not your daddy, and don't say that again. Daddy, daddy. I wanted to kick him, but I didn't. And uh, <laughs> this, this is a true story. And I said, boy, I sure hope his parents find this little kid. He's lost, calling me daddy. Somebody hear that, I'd be in real trouble. You know, people like to gossip. And the first thing is somebody in church said, I heard the little boy calling Pastor Jimmy daddy. <laughs> Not that one. Now, we can have fun, Amen. 
But I'll tell you right now, if you're without Jesus Christ tonight, you're not sure that you're saved, you're not sure that you're sure that you're sure that you're sure that you're sure you're going to heaven. If you die within the next two minutes, you're going to split hell wide open. Nobody likes to preach on hell anymore. It's real. It's hot. It's enlarged itself. And that's where people go without Jesus Christ. He said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you're lost without Jesus Christ, your heart quits beating. They rush you to the hospital. They can't get you revived. You will wake up in hell. But if you're saved, you'll wake up in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, that's your choice. God never sends anybody there. They choose to go there. Whosoever will may come. And if you're here tonight and you don't know my Jesus, here's where you're going. Would you bow your heads, please? Every head bow and every eye close. We've had a good time laughing, and that's what God wants us to do. A merry heart is good for you. But I'm serious now. Is there anybody here not sure if they died today, they would go to heaven. If you're not sure about that, slip your hand up. God bless you. Anyone else? This is serious, this is serious stuff. We've, we've had good time singing and dancing and stuff like that, but I'm talking about eternity. Where would you spend eternity if you died today? And if you can't say I'd go to heaven, then you need to be saved. Anyone else? By the raise of the hand. You better make sure. You could die tonight in your sleep. You say, don't try to scare me. I wish I could scare you to death. I wish I could let you know how hot hell is. Because once this service is over, you've heard the message. I ain't beating around a bush with you. When you die, you're going to go to either heaven or hell. Is there anyone else? One person raise their hand. Is there another person say, preacher, I'm not sure if I die today, I'd go to heaven. You going to let the devil keep you there? He's a liar. He wants you to go to hell. Anybody? I'm not sure. You better make sure. I'm not sure. Okay, we had one raise of hand. If you met that young lady while they're playing, would you come up here? Don't let the devil keep you in that seat. And I'll pray with you or the pastor or some lady will pray with you. Don't let the devil keep you there. Don't let pride keep you there. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about eternity. You choose. You walk out of the house of God tonight, not saved. You choose if you die tonight where you're going to go. Second question I ask, will somebody come and pray with this young man? If you're here tonight, you've been falling and failing and slipping into sin, and you want to get prayed for? Keep getting up. 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 If you fail, keep getting up. If you had heartaches, keep getting up. If you said some things or done some things you shouldn't do, keep getting up. Don't let the devil keep you there. Keep getting up. Somebody pray with this young lady. For the members of the lighthouse, you've got the greatest opportunity you'll ever have on the face of the earth. You may not realize it now, but one day you will. That God's grace has been extended to you. He's a God of a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. He's a graceful God. He's an amazing God. Maybe you just need to pray tonight. Maybe some, you're going through some struggles and you just need to pray. Well, there's an altar here. Maybe you just need to come and pray. Anybody? Anybody? Want to come and pray? You, we all need to pray. Anybody else want to come and pray? This, this is better business than the White House. This is God's house. This is the most important 
business, if you want to call it that, on the face of the earth. We're doing God's work. We're doing God's work. Keep getting up. We're doing God's work. If you're struggling in some area of your life, why don't you come and talk to the Lord right now about it and keep getting up and turn away from it and ask God to forgive you. Anyone else? 